podcast. We demystify what goes on behind the therapy room door. Join us on this voyage of discovery and co-creative conversations. This is The Therapy Show, Behind Closed Doors podcast with Bob Cook and Jackie Jones. Welcome to the next episode of The Therapy Show with Bob Cook and myself, Jackie Jones. And we're going to be talking about working with the anxious client in this week's episode, which is something that I see an awful lot of in clients. That's probably the main reason that people make contact with me. Oh, okay. Perhaps we're going to start off with you in reverse a moment. So if you gave a picture uh, of an anxious client, you know, give me, I'd be interested if you work mostly with a lot of anxious clients. Um, how would they present them? Um, usually talking very fast and giving me lots of information, probably before we even meet each other. They, they need me to know their story through an email or a message or something. They're, they're usually very good at sharing things, in so, my experience. So they're very, they talk very fast? Usually, they're, yeah. They're, would you say they're highly energetic? Yeah, nervous energy. No, lots of nervous energy, and they are their words are tumbling out to try and explain their story even before they've met you. Yes. And then there's the other extreme. <laughs> What's the other extreme then? Where they're not very good at sharing anything and they're quite critical and fearful of saying too much and everything. So those people, even though, so the common theme is uh, nervousness, would you say, high yeah. energy, wanting to, yeah, uh, and, and um, that's the common theme, but then you get different categories of people who sh want to share a lot, but others that find it hard to actually get their anxiety out. Yeah, need, need a lot of permission to be able to talk about things. You see, I think that's, yeah, I, I, let's start there then. I think what you just said there is very, very important, uh, especially with somebody who's anxious. Permission by the therapist to tell their story. Mm. And more than that, to take their time to tell the story. So this is where a therapist might, I know if you listen to the last podcast, we were talking about how a therapist might um, be instrumental in the pace of the clinical work in terms of rapport. This might be where it's very important for a therapist to slow down the procedure. And to, but the best way to do it is where you just started off, Jackie. In my opinion, is to give the client permission. Oh, it's okay. Just take your time. Yeah. I'm, yeah. Just just slow down. A bit. I know you. I can see you're very anxious about this. So we've got a whole hour. So you know, you start wherever you want to start. So, I see, I think permissions for an anxious client is really important. It's like saying to them, you know, everything's okay. You know, the world's not going to, you wouldn't say it like this, but the inference might be the world won't collapse. It's okay, we've got plenty of time. You just, you just take your time. I, I, I hear you might be feeling apprehensive or anxious, and it's okay for us to just talk, take our time talking, or however you want to do it in terms of permission. Yeah, yeah. So I think to give permissions to, because what you're really talking about, Jay, I think, is promoting safety and security within the therapeutic room so the anxious client can feel okay to talk. Yes, yeah, definitely, yeah. And the, I, I don't want to normalise what they're going through, but that it's okay, mm. Mm. Yeah. which might sound a bit... You know, yeah. simplistic, but you know, often anxious clients come to me that it's, am I the worst you've ever seen? You know, is this normal behavior? Should I be behaving? All those questions. Oh, yeah. yeah. And I think it's really okay to just to, to talk like we have just said. So they, the child, the younger part of the anxious client feels that you understand them yeah so I, I i don't really think that is a very um 
you know, it may sound simple, but it's very sophisticated. In other words, yes. yeah. If you don't do that, you can lose the client because they feel they may feel there isn't a space for them to really talk about what it's all about. Yeah. And I think, again, touching on what you've just said then about the, the, the child part, I think it is really important and something I'm very conscious of is providing that safe space and being seen as strong enough to hold them in that if that makes sense because sometimes I think the anxious client feels like they'll overwhelm you <laughs> yes because they feel they're overwhelming themselves yeah 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 absolutely that's why if you give permission to say it's okay just take your time here we'll we'll get to what it's all about start wherever you want to start yeah I mean that's the bit that you're talking about now anxiety takes several forms so we have, um, I just jotted a few down here, but let's start with them. We can have panic disorders, yeah. for example, panic, fear, and people get very anxious and they move into what might go into described as a fear or flight process. Uh, but let's stay with panic and they panic themselves and they get to a place of what I would call fear over fear. Yeah. And anxiety is very high there. In that yeah. panic and often with their panic comes palpitations and of course the panic is all about something it's all really about jackie they're very frightened very scared so they panic themselves uh, and through and the anxiety comes out in, a, in the form of panic and fear yeah and palpitations actually it's, it's in the body the heart races very fast and so I think all, once that's happened, they become super sensitive of any changes in the body. Yes, yeah, yeah. All the changes, like they feel uh, like their stomach is knotted up or they feel, like, you know, or, or, as they get like that, they become very sensitive, I think, to to any changes, yeah. like diarrhea or constipation or any of these symptoms that really come with anxiety, yeah. Yeah. No, yeah. you talk to you about those as well. So panic is another form of anxiety. Um, Post-traumatic stress disorder. Yeah. There's a lot of uh, anxiety with that. You, and what that, what that means is that they have been triggered by something in the present, which reminds them of the past. So something's happened traumatic in their past, which they've repressed. But the, then what happens, they get triggered by something in the present, which opens that door of where they've kept those store, stored traumas and that they come tumbling out. Uh, and that provides a very, it's all based on fear again, you see, Jackie, that, that provides great anxiety. Yeah. Phobias also uh, is another form of anxiety we're talking about people have lots of phobias and are very anxious but again the real bedrock of this is fear so as a therapist we need to provide a very safe environment and also be a safe figure for them when you think of it in terms of safety and security to help the anxious person not be so frightened yeah the fear the, the, you know if the, if you think of this that's what's behind the anxiety extreme fear then that's where you need to start to help the person um have a have a safe therapeutic place as an antithesis to the fear now the fear is usually driven by distorted thinking so it's so you usually find with anxious people they overthink yeah they think, 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 and then they worry about their thinking, and then we have an escalating process. But they, if you ask any anxious person or any client who has extreme anxiety, do you overthink a lot? They would, yes, immediately. And that produces fear, that produces anxiety, and then you're in that whole hamster wheel. Yeah. 
I, I see a lot of the overthinking and the planning and the preparation and everything that goes on. It's, it's, it's a survival mechanism. It's needing to control the environment so they're not going to be caught out or nothing's going to sideswipe them or whatever it is. Well, that you're describing a paranoid client then, yeah. So often they may have power and heightened sense of paranoia with the anxiousness. But, it, but what is the hallmark definitely around anxious clients is overthinking. Mm. The overthinking is usually a coping mechanism to keep themselves safe. Yeah. So with anxious clients, besides having a huge emphasis on safety and security and allowing them to speak, I will want to know what drives the anxiety, what drives the fear. It's usually the distorted thinking. So you need it again to go back to the past to see what some of these belief systems are uh, around self and others that drives the fear. Now, some of that fear might come from some of the, what, what I'm gonna talk about is deep traumas they've had in their history. So they've made then decisions about themselves and the world, which actually feed the anxiety, feel that, you know, uh, feed the fear anyway. So we need to go back and look at some of their belief systems about other people in the world, which might drive anxiety and fear. Like, you know, I'm, I'm not a very nice person. I'm not lovable. I'm not trustworthy. Other people won't like me. And people who are anxious will be constantly comparing themselves. They usually have a very high negative critic, which keeps them in a place of panic and fear. They're very easily very critical themselves because they've externalized this high critic. Interesting. <laughs> That's how I said. I mean, if you, if, you know, 10 to 1, if you go to the doctor with anxiety, you'd probably be given the diagnosis of GAD, which is generalized anxiety disorder, or yeah. traits of GAD, traits. Yeah of generalized anxiety disorder. I thought I thought I knew it was this podcast. So I, thought, I thought I'd just look at what we could call, or what uh, if you went to the doctors uh, and gave you that type of diagnosis. So I looked up GAD and it says, right, somebody, these are the criteria for generalized anxiety disorder. Difficulty in concentrating. Yeah, difficulty in sleeping. Um, a consistent pattern of fatigue, having uh, stomach problems, having um, over sweating, rapid heartbeat. So, you know, it's all the picture we've just been talking about here in a way. Yeah. Uh, but it's, it's, it's built on panic and fear. And at its base level, it's around security and safety. I think, and the therapist needs to pay a lot of attention to security and safety and permissions. But they need to get to the story underneath it all, I think, because I've never seen an anxious baby. So a child, you know, uh, usually what happens is that they make survival decisions again in response to think the environment around them. Um, and then they have this, distorted way of thinking these critical parents on their back and then they get anxious and overthink and over all the things we just talked about um, so you need to get to what the thinking feeling is is and the behavior that comes with that and help them put put more healthy coping mechanisms uh, in place but you need to get i think to the faulty decisions well when i say faulty decisions i mean if you go right back you know, however bizarre the content, it is logical at the time. So it's not faulty in that sense, but it doesn't help them now. Yeah, that I that's a very valid point, that is. And I talk with clients an awful lot about that. Mm. We do the best that we can with what we've got available in that moment. Mm. So what you were saying then, it's, you know often anxious clients will say to me, it's really stupid, you know, I don't know why I do this, it's so stupid. Why can I not go out unless I've got 
X, Y, and Z in my bag. And it's like, well, it's not stupid because it makes it it made sense at the time. Mm. You know, they, they can be really critical of themselves and the things, the processes that they need to go through. You know, if they've got social anxiety or if they, they get anxious when they're going out or whatever it is, they have lots of crutches that they need to take with them. And yeah, they often start, say yeah. it's ridiculous. It's stupid. Yeah. Well, let's start off with a philosoph philosophical, you know, process we I just talked about however bizarre the behavior if you trace it back to where it was made it's going to make logical sense in that context yeah and this is what I'm talking about if you trace the fear back if you trace the social anxiety back yeah to where it began it will be make total sense in that context yeah and that's when you the problem is they carry on as if it's the same it's like a habit they just carry on as if it's the same context when it usually 10 to 1 isn't yeah and i think our brain you know is is really good at certain things and pretty rubbish at others mm. and it it gathers lots of information and connects the dots mm. Mm. that then becomes all around the anxiety in certain situations mm -hmm. you know th th there's a thing it, it fascinated me i was reading a book on it uh, called apophenia where our brain needs to connect the dots so it can hold on to it as a memory only it connects random dots around fear and anxiety well, in transaction analysis, I have a concept called script theory. Yeah. A script means an unconscious life plan, which is formed in childhood, uh, and you play it out throughout life. And I think that's what we do. We make decisions, which become part of a life plan, and then we carry it out. Even when we don't, even in the most unhealthy of situations. So a therapist needs to help the person I think change those decisions which are causing the fear and the anxiety and implement healthy ones and healthy coping mechanisms as well. Yeah. And the first step though is right at the beginning is to help the person through permissions have the space to talk, have the space to slow down. Yeah. Because though it may not feel frightening for the therapist in the room, the action, the client the anxious client is probably or might be petrified yeah not necessarily of what's happening in the room and i think it's a really important point that you say to clients especially anxious clients anyway i know you feel anxious however that might be coming from a different time zone so it's not that you discount their things in the present but actually it might be coming from it's a bit like doctor who it might be coming from a different place even though you feel it in the present. Mm -hmm. So in other words, you're helping, helping them look for triggers. Mm. Yeah, and that's a really nice way of putting it. You know, it's not discounting the, the feelings that they're, you know, having in that moment, but it's coming from a different time zone. Yeah, I like that. Mm. I should do write an article with Doctor Who phenomena. Yeah. So it's, it's like, it's a very important that, you know, clients, especially from this framework, could start understanding that what they feel and think in the present isn't necessarily, doesn't necessarily have, have its origin there, but comes a different time zone, and that's where we need to go to. Yeah. And if we change in that different time zone, then what's happening in the present will change. Yeah. So you have to connect those dots you're talking about. Yeah. And it, it's like the butterfly effect, <laughs> you know, going backwards and in the present and backwards and in the present and just seeing and exploring our past without judgment, being curious about things without being critical. That's what I love in the therapy room. Let's just have a look and see what we come up with. That's right. And what you're going to come up with with somebody who's presents in an anxious way is that their narrative inside their head will be very critical. Mm, yeah. 
Now, again, if you can get to a place where they start really taking on board, it isn't themselves being critical about themselves, it's that they've taken on board somebody else's critical self, you're halfway there. Uh, and for those people listening, and you know, one of the things that I, I love about transactional analysis is the parent, adult, and child, and the the you know, the pack and the from a very, very young age, we just absorb things from our parents and our surroundings without life experience to filter what's useful and what's not do I want that or do I not want it we just absorb it all and you know for me personally my critical parent when she's in full flow is is amazing <laughs> there's a there's a television program which is, I just started to watch so there's only six episodes it's called Professor T oh I've, I've, yeah I've started to watch Saturday that night. and yeah. he's a very disturbed professor actually and he helps the um, detectives he's a I think he's a professor of criminology but he's very disturbed and um, he he has internalized a very critical mo mother mm. and he, he can see uh, he's a critical mother in, in quite a lot of things and it's not surprising you know that people get very frightened when they are you know um, responding to that critical narrative in their head, just as they did in that original childhood situation. Yeah. And the other thing about people who are anxious, they often have a part of themselves that needs to be perfect. And if they're not getting it perfect, then something awful will happen. So they'll always be comparing themselves to other people and things like that, because they have to get things right. Yeah. So non-judgmental attitude is really important for a therapist. Yeah. I I I like that. Oh. It's not straight not so easy to do, by the way, because what well, you may think or what I might think as a non-judgmental transaction is often or can be perceived in a different way than you actually clinically mean it and you'll never know so the best we can do is come from a i think as much as we can a non-judgmental judgmental attitude yeah yeah and in the therapy room i'd like you say that do i don't think we can be a hundred percent neutral in all our thoughts but i i would like to say that most of the time I'm in a I'm okay you're okay situation yeah you might be yeah and I'm great by the way but the problem I think is is that uh, your clients won't always see you that way no not, but then that's something that we can discuss. That yeah yeah <laughs> if you know about it if they tell you yeah and if someone has had a very frightening parents for example um, then what you may think, do and feel is so opposite to their way of thinking, feeling and experience uh, that you're in another ball game. Yeah. You know, in, t in, in no psychotherapy terms, we're, we're then talking about transference and things like that. Yeah. But I think that's why I love transactional analysis, because there's lots of diagrams and things that you can share in the session to explore and explain all of this stuff. Yeah. That it's it's not it's it's not coincidence that these things happen. It's not a fluke that we shift from I'm okay to I'm not okay. And these things, if if somebody's got that understanding, then I think in the therapy room we can switch it on and switch it off. Oh. You know, if I'm talking yeah. about life scripts or the OK Corral or all this stuff, they get they get what I'm talking about. Mm. Yes, I mean, I would call that educative therapy, and I think it's a you know big space for educative therapy. So we're thinking. So on the last bit of this, I can leave the people who's listening to this with a picture. It, what is the most important thing for me, anyway, 
in the treatment of somebody who presents anxiously is to give them space to talk mm. and to have a concentration on safety and security so they will feel safe to be able to talk. And that will mean the therapist, I think, leaving their ego out of the room to enable the, to enable the space to occur so the other person can feel safe to be able to talk and most importantly feel understood yeah now half the battle is if they feel understood they'll become less anxious secondly is to help them put past to present so it's the same with the depressive client in a way if you can help them understand what drives the anxiety how come they were so scared in the first place then you're halfway there. Because yeah. people don't get frightened for no reason. So the, the child of them has become frightened because of reasons. This isn't yeah. to do with them. No, no. And like you say, it makes sense. If you're trying to protect yourself from something that's big and scary, it, it all makes perfect sense, yeah. So how then does the client become safe and secure with the therapist? So I think it's going to take time. Uh, they've got the space to talk. They're going to feel understood is the most important things. Because you're right, usually they come from a place where they might well overwhelm the therapist because they've got so many needs and uh, they're over needy or whatever they're saying in their head. Um, so what you said right at the beginning of the podcast I really liked, which is about giving permissions for safety and security for exploration between the two of you. Yeah. Yeah. I think that's really important. Mm. And th th being curious and not critical, you know, judgment. I know, I know there probably will be a lot of judgment, but, you know, that it's understandable why they do what they do. If you're looking through their eyes, it all makes perfect sense. Yeah, and as they start making new decisions on an emotional and thinking level, behaviour will change. Yeah. There's something that always kind of, I don't know, gets to me is when you see these online courses or or certain therapists and i won't name who they are say that they can cure people of their anxiety and fear mm. what are your thoughts on that well, what do you mean by gets to you that you know anxiety is part of a human response to something that we think we need to be protected against and if somebody says that you can be anxiety free for the rest of your life. I'm not sure whether that's a, a promise that we should be making. I certainly don't do it. It's part no, of the fight I'm, and flight I'm, and it will always be part of us as human beings. Yeah, I think we, there's a level of anxiousness that is existential and part of the human condition. So, I, th you know, without getting into the world of ethics here, because it's not a podcast on ethics, but I, I think it would be unethical for somebody to claim that. Yeah. And alongside that, I think most people that come through, probably, you can tell me, you might disagree with me here, but certainly in my practice anyway, uh, and I'm not practicing anymore, most people that came through the door uh, would project a Father Christmas transfers onto me. In other words, that I can cure everything and take everything away and, everything will be all right and most clients that come in the door to see therapists but want a quick fix and want to want the pain taken away and hope that you will do it yeah now of course we all know that's not true but who are we to take that belief away the problem is is the people that in print say that or the people that actually i think we are on to the edge of an, an ethical process is then because of course it's, un it's impossible. However, I do think most clients are coming with that view or that desire, that unconscious process, even yeah. though intellectually they might 
understand that you can't fix everything and they they need to be part of that process as and well i think the child in them might have that desire yeah 100 percent. if you're suffering from anxiety the desire is so you don't want to feel that ever again yeah i, I can understand and, that but and that, you're, and that you can fix it yeah and here am i paying all this money to you and you should jolly well fix it quickly yeah yeah so you know back to so i think it's unethical to actually advertise that way because you're advertising something you can't possibly do and in fact it's an imp you know it's like saying you're some sort of um, superhuman being and you can cure XXXX. And we know that no, it's not true it, it, because the other person in the process, i.e. the client, has to take some responsibility in this because they made the decisions in the first place. Yeah. And that is a very important thing, I think. Which? That they have a choice. They made a decision at some point in their past and they can make a new decision. Absolutely. That's so, how it works a lot of the time in my therapy room when they have that realization. Yeah, it's how, you, but see, Jackie, I don't disagree with you. And it's how you get there. Yes, yeah. Because you might have to go to the child, which is so broken to the place they didn't actually have a decision because they, they were around these significant powerful other people which were violating them invading them traumatizing them or whatever words you want to use they didn't actually have a choice so they might actually feel in the regression they might actually feel they haven't got a choice yeah so we need to get to the place of healing so they can actually you know differentiate out between what was and what is now so they then can start to do things differently yeah yeah yeah, because ultimately, as human beings, our, our aim is for survival, and we do that to the best of our ability in that moment. Yeah, and yeah, you're right. And I, it's, I'm really giving a plea for the therapist to go to these places of regression, these younger parts of the self and the client, to give them space for some healing before they can move to a place where they've got to make some decision of choice. Yeah. We, we have to go to the healing places to enable the person to get to a place where they believe they can make a choice. Yeah. I, I am all for autonomy and I'm all for somebody taking charge and all the things you're just talking about. But I'm also believe that we need to get to that place in the younger self of healing before the therapist can actually believe they can make those decisions mm. till the client actually can get to a place where the broken parts have been healed enough for, to be, for them to believe they may just be powerful enough to make a decision but if you do it for them they'll never get there no if the therapist does it for them or, or if the timings, and it's so easy to do, by the way, if the timing's slightly off, um, then, you know, the therapy can go wrong. So it's a very delicate, very, very delicate process, what you're talking about in terms of dealing with people who've been highly traumatized and how they get to a place where they can believe that they can take back some of the power which was taken from them. Yeah. And it can be a very slow process. Has to be a slow process. And that's okay. Yeah. It, it's We're all unique and some people don't need that long and other people do and that's okay. And with the anxious Clyde, the more you give permissions of the beginning i think the more they will calm down yeah be able to go to these places we're talking about yeah yeah without adding more fear on the fear because often that with anxious clients that can be how it feels it's the fear of the fear and it's layer upon layer it's you know mm. yeah so permissions 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 
order of the day. So they feel Thank safe you. and secure. Until the next time, Bob. Yeah, till the next next time. And what is the next? Where are we moving to? We have a list. I don't know where we're moving to next time because uh, sometimes we keep changing. <laughs> yeah, I, I thought maybe we had on the list, we were thinking of things like how to deal with the traumatised clients, you know, yes. trauma. Uh, we've got eating disorders, we've got many other things. But I think Attachment, we, we, had, we had quite a few things in the mix. Yeah, so we could start with uh, trauma. Okay. How, how to work with trauma in therapy. Yeah. Could be, and that might go to one and two, but how to work with trauma is I think a really important part. And we need to, we need to talk about that. And of course, another podcast, which I think is one and two, I don't think we can do it in one, but anyway, is how to work with the sexually abused or uh, client. You know, that I mean, trauma is part of sexual abuse, I know, but we can split the two out. Okay. Those will be the next two yeah. or four, dependent on how it goes. <laughs> That's it. Okie dokie. Thanks a lot. Uh, better get off. See you next See time. You soon. Bye. 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 You've been listening to The Therapy Show, Behind Closed Doors podcast. We hope you enjoyed the show. Don't forget to subscribe and leave us a review. We'll be back next week with another episode.